Hello and welcome to the Spike podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and back with me this week, as ever, we have Spike's editor, Tom Slater. Hello. And I'm delighted to welcome an extra special guest, presenter of GB News' Free Speech Nation and author of The New Puritans, Andrew Doyle. Hello. Coming up on today's show, the indictment of Donald Trump, the grooming gang scandal and the meaning of woke. So Donald Trump has been arrested, indicted this week, the first US president or former president to be to face any kind of criminal charges. He is accused on 34 counts of falsifying his business records, essentially in order to cover up his affair with porn star Stormy Daniels. Now, Tom, I think it's fair to say there's a consensus, even among some kind of anti-Trump figures, um, even among the liberal media, that these charges are a little bit weak. Well, there's a consensus starting to form, definitely. I mean, one thing that was really interesting was there was so much excitement running up into this. Mm. There was even a trend on Twitter, which was Merry Arrestmus. Yeah. Uh, so the, the so-called resistance were very excited. There, there is a certain type of elite liberal who have longed for the day that they could see Donald Trump in handcuffs. It's a yeah. kind of, you know, almost sexual excitement that you saw them <laughs> displaying on social media when that happened. Um, but what was interesting was that almost instantly, as soon as the indictment landed, it had been pretty heavily briefed already, not exclusively, not across the board, but even at kind of liberal titles, the legal journalists, shall we say, rather than maybe the political journalists, were pointing out that these indictments were pretty ginned up. I mean, you mm. say it was, what, 35 in indictments. It's essentially one crime split up into 35 pieces uh, because of the fact that it all centres around Donald Trump allegedly falsifying business records in order to reimburse his lawyer, Michael, his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, uh, there are other parties involved as well, for the hush money payments allegedly paid to the porn actress, Stormy Daniels, who she claims has had, had she claims she had an affair with Trump. Uh, and because it was split up into 35 invoices, basically, mm. <laughs> it's become 35 charges. So you're already <laughs> starting to see the manipulation going in there. The other thing is that this crime of falsifying business records is a misdemeanor. It's yeah. not necessarily... It's serious, but it's not the sort of thing that you would think a prosecutor would try to bring down a former president for. It would look too petty and political. Especially and so seven years after the alleged facts. Well, that's another thing. It's actually passed the statute of limitations, as you suggest. That's another round of legal acrobatics that had to take place in order to bring this forward. Uh, so what they've done, or what Alvin Bragg, the DA, has done, is to inflate it into a felony um, by dint of this claim, without getting too much into the weeds of this, that... The, this falsification was covering up another crime. He doesn't spell it out in the indictment, but he, he has gestured heavily to this being around trying to influence the 2016 election. So already with the kind of level of complexity you're talking about, you're already starting to see some of the cracks in this. And also given the fact that when it comes to Trump using his own money to pay off someone to silence them, I mean, if this was the standard for interfering in an election, mm. then it's hard to imagine any president actually not being in prison on those kind of particular charges. So it is starting to unravel. You saw Slate describe it as shaky. You mm. saw, I believe it was Vox, of all places, describe it as dubious. Other places went with ambitious, uh, which <laughs> shows a bit of motivated reasoning. But yes, to your point, it's been interesting that even with the strength of desire for this to be the one, once again, yeah. the so-called resistance has stopped, just about short of actually getting him, it looks like. Andrew, what do you think this says about the the resistance, the hashtag resistance, the sort of elite liberals that want to bring down Trump? I mean, isn't it extraordinarily authoritarian? Didn't it used to be, didn't they used to clutch their pearls when Trump would say, lock her up, lock her up yeah. about Hillary Clinton? Well, I mean, I don't want to agree with Trump too much, and I don't on many things, but, you know, when he described this as uh, the weaponization of the legal system, it's difficult to disagree. Yeah. I mean, it clearly is politically motivated. There's no real getting around that. You know, even uh, anti-Trumpers, as you've said, Tom, know that this is going nowhere, that this is such a flimsy case. They're splitting up into 34 different counts. I mean, that almost feels like them just trying to satisfy some kind of, like you say, a wet dream kind of a sexual <laughs> thing, because each one would have a few years in prison. So you can then fantasize about him living the rest of his life in jail. Yeah. Um, but it's in the just, jumpsuit. Orange right. man in the orange jumpsuit. Right, exactly. <laughs> but, it's, but it's just so, uh, it's so unlikely to happen. But, um, you know, and that I think is... Is a real problem this this desperate attempt to elevate it to a felony uh it, it just doesn't look good for them and i wonder i mean some people have been speculating uh, because of course trump's polls opinion polls have gone up as a result yeah. of this this really feeds into his narrative about you know the, this deep state that's against him and all the rest of it so is it maybe that the democrats really i mean i know they want trump to be to be running yeah so maybe this is part of that potentially but, but also it just smacks of total hypocrisy. You know, Alvin Bragg, who's the, 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 the Manhattan DA, 
has uh, for a few years now been going on about how he's got a sort of soft on crime approach. He doesn't want to prosecute people for crimes. I mean, I was yeah. in New York recently and I tried to buy some shampoo and it was locked up behind glass. You had yeah. to ask for it. Every item above $5 was. And yeah. the reason for that is if you steal anything below $1,000, it's not a crime and the police won't do anything about it in New York. Um, because Alvin Bragg has been saying, you know, we don't prosecute people for that kind of thing. Uh, it, just yeah. let it go. And yet with this, he's saying, no, actually, I'm going to be really tough on this misdemeanor, mm. which I'm going to pretend is a felony. And, you know, it, it, it just seems ridiculous. And yes, most definitely politicized. Whichever side you stand on the divide, you've got to see this for what it is. Definitely. And um, we should talk a little bit about how, you know, how Trump is going to play this. Let's watch a clip of Trump um, coming out swinging um, at Mar-a-Lago after the indictment. Where we are right now, I have a Trump-hating judge with a Trump-hating wife and family whose daughter worked for Kamala Harris and now receives money from the Biden-Harris campaign and a lot of it. They're threatening jail terms. But talk about Trump and you'll go free. This is where we are as a nation. Who would have thought they can't beat us at the ballot box, so they try and beat us through the law. Tom, I mean, this just, as Andrew was suggesting earlier, this just feeds Trump's narrative. It's going to energize his supporters to think, you know, the deep state is out to get him. And the thing is, in this instance, he has got a point. I mean, that particular mm. line there about saying they're coming after me with the law because they couldn't beat me at the ballot box, that is obviously true. That is what yeah. has been happening since 2016 because of the fact that the democratic establishment, the liberal elite, whatever you want to call it, didn't see this coming, I think, contributed to coming about by smearing, as Hillary Clinton did, his voters as deplorables, yeah. by telling people on one hand to vote for them, on the other hand, that they're scumbags. Not usually a particularly good strategy, but they followed it to a T, as always. Um, and also, ever since the election, mm. trying to find a series of legal, procedural, outside of politics routes to try and do away with him. So you had the Russiagate conspiracy theory, which have tried and failed to pin his election on Russia. Um, obviously, since the ridiculous and outrageous scenes of January 6th, again, this kind of quasi-judicial process mm. to try and pin January 6th, not just as a ridiculous riot, um, but also as a potential insurrection. Um, you've also had the democratic establishment over the years leaning on big tech yeah. um, and even sections of the security services leaning on big tech in order to censor Trump and Trumpists. Um, and what's interesting is that even after they defeated him at the ballot box, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even exactly. after he was done with, even after he had paid a pretty high political price being turfed out of office as a one-term president, they still can't stop. Yeah. Um, I mean, to Andrew's point about whether or not this is all, I, I, whether this is all kind of part and parcel trying to engineer him or at least trying to put a bit of wind at his back to make him the candidate in 2024. On the one hand, I don't think they're probably capable of this level of strategic thinking. I think a lot of this is sort of visceral. <laughs> yeah. But I think it is also true that they do want Trump. Mm. You certainly see that that they're less scared about them because also that what they want to do is kind of tarnish him but still have him up there as a, as a kind of easier sort of scarecrow of a candidate in comparison to what they might be facing from Ron DeSantis or whatever. So it's, a, um, it's one of those things which throughout this whole saga that has been post-2016, yeah. I think it's really vindicated the position that Spice has always taken in relation to Trump, which is that we're not pro-Trump, we're not anti-Trump, we're anti-anti-Trump, mm. which is to say, we don't have much truck with Trump and his liberal ways at all. He's a you know, pantomime wannabe authoritarian in many respects. He's just very bad at it. Yeah. What's difficult and what was clear from the beginning was that the, the resistance to him, the backlash to him, the attempt to put him and deplorables back in their basket, as it were, <laughs> uh, were always worse. They yeah. were going to rip up these legal norms that they said he wanted to rip up. They were going to usher in censorship by the back door. They were the ones who wanted to again, plays kind of scorched earth policy, even if it meant throwing out every liberal and democratic process they claim to be defending. I think that again has been vindicated this week. And, and Andrew, you know, obviously, as Tom says, you know, Trump is a hugely, hugely flawed figure. But nonetheless, didn't that sort of 2016 vote represent something important? It's certainly against hitting back against these elites who are clearly going crazy right now. Well, exactly. And all of this kind of manoeuvring will also play into the kind of people who sort of were so exasperated that they voted for a candidate they would never normally do. And that's going to happen with this, I'm, I've no doubt. It's really going to help him. I'd love to see some consistency from the Democrats. I mean, they're, they're making the claim that had this hush money not been paid, it would have radically altered the outcome of the election. Mm. But that for some reason, they don't think a story about Joe Biden's son uh, from the laptop would have yeah. altered the election. So there, there's <laughs> no consistency there at all. 
And I mean, all, I mean, also the, 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 that news wasn't the clip about grabbing him by the pussy. Didn't that come out a few weeks before the election? Yeah, that didn't seem to dent it. I'd say so, that's more damning than yeah, an affair. The, an affair with a, a porn star or whatever. So I, you know, um, yeah, I think this is going to be ultimately very bad for the Democrats. But also, I worry about what what is it going to do in the future? Insofar as doesn't this kind of open the floodgates to anyone doing this and anyone yeah. sorts? You could find something to try and prosecute any former president if you like. I mean, I I cannot believe the Republicans are not going to resort to the now now that the floodgates are open i'm sure yeah. they'll do the same yeah definitely do you want to add anything Tom? no i think just to tack on to that i think one thing that you stumble into when you get into this particular debate around trump and the uh, the charges that are laid against him is this idea well of course no one is above the law even yeah. the president isn't this a wonderful thing mm. that we're um, actually seeing a uh, former president in handcuffs no one should be above the law, but no one should be below it either. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing with Trump. It's one thing if a crime is committed, is investigated, and someone is punished for it. What's happened with Trump, not just in this particular case and this particular uh, jurisdiction, but on various different fronts, some more serious than the others, is that they've basically taken an approach, and this is what Alvin Bragg was elected on, a platform of essentially, implicitly, of let's find something to get him with. That is yeah. not an ideal <laughs> perspective, particularly when you're dealing with politics, because that does invite, as you're saying, Andrew, the law further into politics. It makes um, the law a political weapon. And if you think back to American presidents of various different parties over the years, or of both parties, I should say, over the years, the idea that you couldn't find something to stick most of them with <laughs> stretches the imagination. So, of yeah. course, you'd be ushering in that tit-for-tat thing. But again, it's, it's the resistance destroying democratic norms, supposedly in a campaign to preserve them, which I think is what we're seeing again. You know, when you go to the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? I mean, you don't want some random passerby looking in on you. So why would you let people look in on you whenever you go online? Your online privacy is important, and that's why I use ExpressVPN, and you should too. Most people don't even realize this, but your internet service provider knows every single website you visit. They can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who can then use your data to target you. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. It works on phones, laptops, even routers, so that everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. And all you have to do is just fire up the ExpressVPN app and click one button. It's as easy as closing the bathroom door. Even better, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free if you go to expressvpn.com slash spiked. That's expressvpn.com slash spiked for three extra months for free. expressvpn.com slash spiked. The UK government has unveiled a new strategy for dealing with grooming gangs. Rishi Sunak has said we can't let political correctness or cultural sensitivities stand in the way of dealing with this crime. Home Secretary Suella Braverman has caused a bit of a stir by suggesting that this is mainly Pakistani men targeting white women, um, or white girls, I should say. Tom, what have you made of the reaction in particular to Braverman's comments? Because that seems to have dominated the, the story, really. We're, you know, Again, we're having a go at the Home Secretary and missing the broader picture. No, definitely. She, that seems to be the story of um, whenever Suella Braverman is in the news at the moment. I think what they pounced on was, a, I think it was a line in an article in the Mail, was it, that I think referred to almost all in yeah. relation to the perpetrators of um, grooming gangs and being of Pakistani Muslim heritage. And essentially what they've seen here is an opportunity to try and knock down the idea that this is a problem to begin with yeah. and that the issues around cultural sensitivities didn't obviously play a role in the way in which cases in Rotherham or Telford or elsewhere weren't properly investigated and kind of hushed up. Um, now, of course, the information in this area is incredibly patchy by dint of the fact that a lot of these crimes have never been properly prosecuted. They go yeah. back decades and decades. A lot of them... Um, of the perpetrators are walking free and there is an array of studies and so on but what you see is so much dishonesty in the way in which these problems are talked about yeah so everyone's been pointing to this home office report in 2020 which essentially concluded that the data wasn't good enough to make any kind of hard and fast claims about which group might be more likely 
to be perpetrators of a particular crime. It did, however, also point to the fact that roughly, it seems, because we are a white majority country, the vast majority of, or the majority of a majority of the perpetrators is going to be white. But there are also studies which suggest ethnic minorities are disproportionately represented. Yeah. Um, but there's been an array of other studies, of course. There's one that Raki Bassan, who writes for Spiked, has pointed out in 2020, which looks at prosecutions. It finds that... Um, people with Muslim sounding names, particularly those of Pakistani heritage, predominate prosecutions. And what's interesting about that side is it explodes the idea that this is an Asian wide phenomenon. It says that this, it's not about being from Bangladesh, it's not about being from India, it's not mm. about being Hindu. I think in the case of Hindus, that actually had a negative effect on your likelihood to be in these prosecution figures. It is, um, there is an overrepresentation. Now, an overrepresentation does not mean almost all. We also yeah. don't have the data across, uh, across the piece to make any kind of hard and fast claims. But considering that the fact that there's been so many reports now into places like Rotherham and Telford, where you have very detailed official reports, which do point to either a predominance or a majority yeah. of Pakistani perpetrators, or at least ones who are described as Pakistani or Asian, that this is clearly a problem that needs to be confronted. And mm. also those reports also point to the fact that in those localities, it was the fact that that detail led to these cases being dismissed. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's one thing that this debate, when people want to raise this particular issue, there is a particular issue here. It's not purely because people want to have a kind of slam dunk argument about which group is doing it and which isn't. That's an absurd way to look at it. The issue is, is the, is the profile of the perpetrator and potentially the profile of the victims as well in some instances, leading to these crimes not being treated as seriously? Is it yeah. changing the response because of widely discussed concerns around cultural sensitivities, political correctness, people have various different ways of describing it. That is something that does need to be tackled. I think the problem is, is that any opportunity that um, certainly the mainstream media, certainly figures in the Labour Party, many of these crimes have taken place in Labour constituencies, fine to just rubbish the idea that there was any problem to begin with, that there's no there there, they want to say all the time. They'll take it. Uh, but it doesn't take away from the dishonesty of what it is they're doing. And it's yeah. certainly an injustice to the literally thousands of thousands of young women who have been affected by this industrial scale abuse. And Andrew, I mean, what do you make of the sort of claims that to raise these kinds of issues is far right or it's, you know, dog whistle politics, some have suggested, some have accused Suella Braveman of indulging in? Well, that is to repeat precisely the problem that we started out with, mm. which is people failing to investigate crime because they didn't want to be appear, appear as being racist. So now yeah. it'll be, we don't want to pursue this anymore because we don't want to appear to be far right. And, you know, I'm a free speech absolutist, but I'd love if we could ban the phrase dog whistle. It's a nonsense <laughs> phrase. Yeah. You know, they're saying that it was, I think it was the uh, mayor of West Yorkshire saying that Suella Braverman is, is engaged in a dog whistle. She's not sitting there thinking, okay, how can I secretly signal yeah. to my far right followers? I mean, it is infantile to suggest it. Uh, and anyone who does suggest it should be ashamed uh, and not taken seriously, more to the point. Um, but yeah, I mean, clearly, as Tom alludes to, it, it is the case that a lot of these investigations didn't, weren't taken on board, weren't mm. often reported on. You know, as Judy Bindle found at The Guardian, she was trying to break the story and they were saying, no, you can't because, yeah. you know, it, it might be perceived as racist. So it's clear that in these particular crimes, the uh, certainly the cultural background, if not the ethnicity, is a factor, sometimes even in terms of the targeting of the victims. And therefore, it is relevant. So, I mean, I read in the press a lot of people saying, well, what about this group of gro this grooming gang, which is predominantly white on the other side of the country or whatever? Yeah. Why are you not up in arms about that? Well, because the uh, the ethnicity of the perpetrators wasn't a factor in them not being investigated. Yeah. That's why it's a factor now. And the idea that we can't have a conversation, I mean, look, I don't know all the answers, but why can't we have a, a discussion about whether there are certain cultures which have a certain view of women and that does sometimes lead to crime. That is important. You know, in Sweden, they have these sorts of problems, but they deliberately haven't been report recording ethnicity because they just want to pretend it's not a factor. But if it wasn't a factor, why would the German government be giving pamphlets out to refugees saying, by the way, it's not OK to grab women in the genitals uh, when you just feel like it? You know, th th there is an acknowledgement within that that there are some sort of cultural factors. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, it's not Asian. It's a very specific uh, issue. And also, that's not to tar a whole community. Yeah. I'm sure most uh, British Pakistani people are as horrified about this as anyone else. But if there is a predominance within a particular culture and there are these trends, uh, in order to protect victims, it's surely worthwhile at least having the discussion. It's so strange that they'd almost rather racialize it <laughs> than treat this yeah. on a granular level. So again, yeah. there's almost more comfort, although they'll also try and downplay that discussion. But there was at one point, uh, again, just kind of lumping it together as an Asian phenomenon, Again, they'd rather racialise and talk about these things specifically. Because as you say, when you're talking about cultural problems, you're not talking about 
uh, a culture that washes across a whole particular group of that's British, Pakistanis, or whatever. There's some, from some very specific profiles here, depending on the cases you're talking about. Sometimes uh, extended families engaged mm. in this kind of abuse. I mean, this is not something that you're tarring all British, Pakistani people with one brush, but there is something so incredibly obnoxious about the way in which this issue is talked about, because it does show that when you're talking about society, but even when you're talking about the most grotesque mm. crimes, that there is still this hierarchy of victims and hierarchy of perpetrators. So if it's underclass girls, effectively, many of them in care, um, many of them not, not with anyone looking out for them, many of them white, many of them not, as the case is in some instances, they're not really worth bothering about. They yeah. have no platform in society. They're not going to get a Guardian journalist interested in their story tomorrow. And then you have, again, this kind of hierarchy of perpetrators where it doesn't do to talk about crime if it's committed by certain types of people. That's an obnoxious position. I also think if people are genuinely concerned about allowing this issue to be hijacked mm. by the far right or allowing it to be used to drive divides between communities, the worst thing you could possibly do is what we've done over the course of the past 20 years or so, which is to refuse to talk about it and create a situation where the only people who are willing to talk about it were the Tommy Robinsons of this yeah. world, which was more or less the case until about five minutes ago. <laughs> or when Labour MPs tried to raise it, mm -hmm. they, were, they were similarly dismissed as, yeah. as, as far right. I mean, again, it just shows the sort of dangers of silencing, the dangers of censorship, the dangers of political correctness, because, you know, at the end of the day, that has led people to cover up grotesque crimes when they should have been acting on them. Sometimes it feels like the world is going mad. Huge, big name politicians are being arrested or resigning. Everything is changing all the time. But for me, the one thing that's always constant is my shaving and skincare routine. And that's because I've got a subscription to Harry's. Harry's makes it incredibly easy to stay looking fresh. For starters, their razors are great quality. The weighted handle and five blade cartridge make shaving feel extra smooth. And they work even better when you use Harry's foaming shave gel. But that's not all Harry's has to offer. They've also got a whole range of high quality skincare products. Lately, I've started using Harry's brightening eye cream. and I can't believe how well it hides the effects of all those late nights and early mornings. My favorite thing about Harry's is that all these great products are regularly delivered straight to my door. Thanks to Harry's subscription service, I never have to remember to buy new shaving gear or creams before they run out. And if I ever want to adjust or switch up my products, I can make changes directly from my account page. So take it from me, with a Harry's subscription, looking your best is no longer a chore. The best way to get started is with a Harry's trial set, which spiked podcast viewers and listeners can now get for free. And it includes Harry's fantastic brightening eye cream to keep you looking fresher and sharper than ever. So, make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is the £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com slash spiked and have your trial set and brightening eye cream delivered straight to your door. That's harrys.com slash spiked. So, what is woke? What does it mean to be woke? The comedian Kathy Burke has got an interesting new definition of the term. Uh, let's have a look. Can I just say, that gets on my fucking nerves. They're calling you woke if you call out bad things, basically. If you're not racist, you're woke. If you're not homophobic, oh, you're woke. Be woke, kids, be woke. Be wide awake and fucking call it out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Andrew, what do you... Um... What do you make of her definition? Being woke, just being good? Well, no, that's wishful thinking of an incredible kind. And it also, I, I mean, I'm sure she's sincere and that's what she thinks it means. Um, but you, she hasn't done her research. She doesn't know. She doesn't know that the word has been through all kinds of evolutions. Yeah. Uh, every study shows that people, there is no shared definition of this term. There just mm. isn't. Most people don't know what it means. Uh, some people think it means just being nice and not being racist. Um, that's a very small minority of people who think that. Um, you know, there's one key thing. I mean, I, I heard Natasha Devon talking on um, uh, the Jeremy Vine show about this, saying, yeah. you know, if you're against racism, you're woke. Mm. But that's not how most people see the term. Um, she's, she says it's been hijacked uh, by right wingers who use it as a smear against anyone who's progressive. She's missing out a very key moment in the evolution. She's right that it did start out uh, in black civil rights activism, being yeah. alert to social injustice 
particularly racism. But the key turning point is in around 2014-15, when it was hijacked, in fact, by um, activists from the, the critical social justice movement, from the identitarian intersectional movement, mm. authoritarians, in other words. So ever since then, woke does have connotations. For instance, it means someone who is uh, in favor of censorship uh, or criminalizing disagreement or reframing disagreement as hateful mm. in order to silence people. It means someone who believes in problematizing uh, anything that could be deemed to be uh, underpinned by race, uh, racist substructures. For instance, they will say uh, that uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech uh, is uh, racist yeah. uh, because it, it, um, color blindness is a kind of code for white supremacy. Uh, so does, I would like to ask Kathy Burke and Natasha Devon, do they believe in censorship? Do they believe in silencing people for just having unfashionable opinions? Uh, do they believe that Martin Luther King was endorsing white supremacy? And if they say they don't believe that, then they are actually anti-woke according to the most common definition. Um, I mean, it's just been through all, all these evolutions so much that actually it's got to the point where do we have to keep having this debate now? Like, let, let's just uh, accept that the word is, is not fit for purpose, I suppose. Yeah. Although we do need a shorthand for this kind of authoritarian. I mean, in my mind uh, and from my reading, woke, the closest synonym to woke is anti-liberal. That to me is what it really means. It means that you believe in silencing your opponents uh, uh, rather than having a discussion. And Tom, I mean, Andrew's hinted at one aspect in which wokeness is very much not progressive in terms of mm. race, you know, obsessed with racializing people. I mean, you could say, you could pick up the trans stuff as being a strand of woke that is misogynistic, potentially homophobic. I mean, isn't it just the case that actually this isn't progressive at all? It's anti-liberal as, as Andrew says. So, you know, why do people like Kathy Burke feel like they should be on their high horse? If, they're woke. Well, I think, you know, for lack of a better phrase, she needs to educate herself, maybe. But no, it is that <laughs> thing of the reason that Spike spends so much of our time opposing wokeness, critical mm. social justice, whatever you want to call it, left identity politics, well, I don't like calling this stuff left, is not because we think it takes racial justice, women's rights, uh, gay liberation too far, that yeah. it's encroaching upon white people's turf and that they should keep quiet. Not at all. The, the issue is that it's turned into the opposite of what it claims to be. That mm. The main way, in the mainstream, certainly, in which racial ideas are being rehabilitated, in which homophobic ideas are being rehabilitated, in which deeply misogynistic attitudes are being rehabilitated, is through this movement that you could roughly call woke. That's the reason that we oppose it. And yes, I know this term has sort of gone through a lot. It's had this kind of extended etymology now. It's gone from being a term that people did once embrace to a certain extent. Then they claim that they never embraced it. Yeah. Uh, then it became, broadly speaking, something that people like us would use as a shorthand to describe them. They're now, via Kathy Burke and a few others, seems to be a slight renaissance amongst kind of liberal midwit British commentators <laughs> who kind of claim to be it a bit because they think to be that is not to be like the Tories or something. So it's gone yeah. through these various different modes. I think the one thing is, at the very least, we can agree, even if it's an imperfect term, even if it's one that does mean slightly different things to different people, that it does get at something. I mean, Freddie yeah. DeBoer had a good piece on his Substack about this a while ago, saying that whilst he doesn't like to use the term, I think he prefers social justice activism or something like that, he says, don't pretend like you don't know what it means. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it does mean a form of, you could call it, this. I, it's so-called progressive identity politics, yeah. basically. It's not right-wing identitarianism. It's a kind of alleged flavor of left-wing identitarianism, but is almost as regressive in the sense that it does want to carve society up, that it is incredibly authoritarian. All of this is clear. And yeah. whilst I don't think this is some sort of campaign to try and muddy the waters and confuse things, it is interesting that at the very point in which we had a shorthand, yeah. that we had a word that uh, a lot of ordinary people started to begin to clock onto and whatever. That was the point in which that started getting delegitimized. I think speaks to at least a a recognition that this movement is starting to be called out for what it is. Yeah. So people are trying to, again, just kind of muddy the waters and pretend like there's not there's nothing going on here. And Andrew, do you, I mean, doesn't this speak to a sort of desperation among this kind of elite, I guess, to not be pinned down a little bit? I mean, we saw similar arguments over the term elite recently yeah, well, people in denial that they are part of the well, liberal elite well but the, the 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 culture war is largely about language and and the proponents of woke culture will always try and problematize the terms that are used to describe them mm. because if you don't have a term used to describe them then it's very difficult to combat them and, yeah. and they're what they stand for but i you know i i wonder when i hear kathy burke say that is who has she been talking to i don't know anyone who says if you're not racist you're woke I don't know, you know, I don't understand. <laughs> the reason why I oppose woke culture is because I'm opposed to racism. Exactly. And because what woke culture does is it fosters uh, racial division. 
uh, while it, at the same time it, it, it claims to be fighting it. Uh, it promotes the idea of uh, equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity, and therefore it can point to all these nebulous power structures that only people with degrees in critical race theory and gender studies are qualified to detect. And the thing is, those people who uh, uh, advance this ideology, they know full well that what Kathy Burke is saying is wrong. Yeah. But this is the Mott and Bailey tactic, insofar as just if you think that woke just means being nice, being against racism, that's your Mott. It's very easy to defend. Uh, but the people are also aware that there's a bigger Bailey, which is very hard to defend. These idea of systemic power structures, yeah. the idea of separate pro censorship and anti freedom and anti individual autonomy and all the, all the rest of it. Um, and so, I can believe that someone like Kathy Burke or Natasha Devon hasn't really looked into it very much and doesn't realise what these ide ideologues are actually proposing. Mm. But those ideologues are happy to count them as fellow travellers, yeah. and to and and they they play on this ambiguity that they're happy to 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 foster and to make worse. So they will be the ones that will always say, yeah, all, all woke means is to be against racism. And they won't, and, and you know, most people don't have time to look into what it is they actually stand for and what it is they're going to do. But I'm with you, Thomas, but I don't think there is another word. I think we do need a shorthand to sort of get at what it is. You can't every time say, yeah, we're talking about an, an authoritarian, illiberal, regressive movement that has its roots in French post-structuralism. <laughs> you, you can't do yeah. that. You have to just say, and like you say, when you say woke, most people get it. They know what you're yeah. driving at. So it'll have to do for now, I think. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.